Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. Hey! 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm channeling my inner Fonzie here on the Growing in Grace podcast. Mike Kapler, Joel Brzezicki is with me. Uh, he's a little more like Richie Cunningham. I'm the cool <laughs> one, though. Well, I just hope this isn't a uh, Jump the Shark episode. Jump the Shark? Yeah. So you, you, okay. Usually, I'm the one who you say things that's over <laughs> my head. But we're talking about happy days and the Fonz, and you've got to know what the Jump the Shark episode is. Is, is this where he takes his bike over a bunch of cars? A shark, and he's oh. and he's on um, he's skiing. Oh man, I don't remember <laughs> this one. Well, uh, real briefly, because I could get into this, but it, it was an episode where I um, okay in real life I saw an, an, an interview with Henry Winkler who plays the Fonz, and his dad in real life suggested he said T- tell him you ski. So anyway, he said, no, Dad, I'm not going to tell him I ski. But anyway, it ended up, they told him he skied. They said, let's base this episode on Fonzie skiing, and he's going to do this jump. You know, like on skis, you can they got ramps, and you can jump. And so it was the jump, the shark. And um, some people thought that that was so lame, such a lame idea. They said that that's going to make this whole series just go downhill. And so, like, any time... A show, a TV show, has an episode that's just like, you know, like, what are they doing? Why why are they doing this? They don't need to do this stuff. They call it a jump the shark episode. But interestingly, with Happy Days, after that episode, I think they, I think I heard someone say they had two or three more seasons, They and they were still on top for a while. So it didn't, like, really drain the ratings like they people thought it would. But people had a hard time with them them doing that. Well, and I'm sure, I'm sure when he was on the skis, it was probably just a fake screen in the background that looked like a probably. fake screen in the background. Either, either that, or it was like a, a, a stunt double, something like that. I can, yeah, I can, yeah. I can barely picture it in my head, but I, can, well, I, I, I remember I, it. But. I didn't know that as, as, as <laughs> much of a classic TV fan as I am. But well, hey, you learned shark, something. That, that's news to me. Your education, man. I mean, it, it's worth every penny that I'm probably going to end up having to pay. <laughs> I'm just surprised that you learned something from me about classic TV. (laughs) (laughs) Usually it's you schooling me. Well, I do remember a lot of stuff, too, but anyway. Well, yeah, that one slipped past me. But, you know, it's it's hard for me to find old Happy Days episodes to stream. I guess I haven't seen them for a while. I don't don't know uh, where you can watch them. It was such a popular show in the 70s. Oh, yeah. It was... You know, about as popular as you could get. And and the funny thing is, do um, it, it took you know it was in the seventies, but it, the setting was in the fifties, Milwaukee in the fifties. Mm-hmm. And then you mm-hmm. know, um, Mork and Mindy. Mm-hmm. That was a spinoff from Happy Days. It was Days, a spinoff because Mork came to Milwaukee and met Fonz and Richie and all those people. Well, then anyway, then the spinoff, Mork and Mindy, took place in the eighties. <laughs> In, in, yeah, interesting. in Colorado. <laughs> in the you 80s. know, another spinoff from Happy Days, right? The Laverne and Shirley. Yeah. 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 The Laverne and Shirley. Laverne and Shirley. I, I, I got to say, I was never a big fan of either of those spinoffs. I'm just, just for the record. Well, I liked Mark and Mindy, and I liked um, Lenny and Squiggy on Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad somebody did. Well, four minutes into this podcast, and. <laughs> Right. Where have we? Okay. Where, what Let's are we doing God. here? <laughs> okay, if we have to, it'll get us closer <laughs> to him. We'll do it. <laughs> hey, um, you you had somebody bring up a question a while back, and it got us thinking that this is probably the norm on how people think because of I don't know whatever religious sources they've been exposed to most of their life. And ultimately, I, I you can correct me on this, but ultimately, I'm just leading in here. Uh, he was kind of asking the question, is is the gospel of grace really as good as, as you guys say? In other words, I think he was saying, is there a catch? Is there something else? I know we bring him up a lot. Rich ruler. 
when he came up to <laughs> Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's people asking that question all the time. What do I have to do? What, how can I be sure? Um, this sounds too good to be true. Is there is there a catch? So let's talk about that. Yeah, it, I've got to do something, right? I mean, it's got to be, you know, God, yeah, thank you, God, for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for sending your son. But it can't be that easy. I mean, there's got to be something that I have to do. I mean, i got to be kind of like what we talked about last week. I've got to, maybe I've got to be, be devoted in prayer. Maybe i got to um, read my Bible so much. Maybe i got to do X amount of good works. I've got to be good. I, I've got to, in order to really, really be saved, in order to, to God really count uh, me as justified and righteous. I mean, I if I do bad things, and if I don't do really good things all of the time, or at least most of the time, you know, like, is, does this really stick? Does it really stand? You know, there's got to be a catch. It can't really be that easy. I mean, people might not say it that way. You might not word it that way. Or maybe you will, but maybe you do. But there's this feeling, there's a sense that people have that um, God is expecting something from them. Uh, even though, you know, Paul calls it a gift, you know, the gift of righteousness, the gift of grace. It's God's gift. God justifies the ungodly, you know, Romans 4 or 5, to him who does not work, who does not work, but believes. On him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. It's that it. So it really is that simple. But we get this thinking that there's got to be something I got to do. It it can't be that simple. But really, Paul says it's the person who does not work, and he even words it this way: uh, to the one who works, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So I mean, if God is, is if God, if you think God is expecting you to do works in order to be right with Him, then that means that you are saying that He is paying you wages. He owes you for your works. You've done some works to get yourself right with God or keep yourself right with God, and so God is now paying you a debt. God owes you a debt for your works. That's what Paul's saying here in, in Romans four four. And then he says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. It goes totally against this world system that we're in, where you have to earn something. You have to do something in order to get something. You, you, there's nothing free. There's no free lunch. You, know, they, you, can't, you just don't get anything for free. And especially with God. I mean, how can you get anything for free with God? He's this... Uh, demanding uh, taskmaster, and you've got to do something. I mean, that's, again, people might not word it that way, but that's the thinking. But really, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. It doesn't say to him who justifies those who do good. It says mm -hmm. God justifies the ungodly. That person's faith is accounted for righteousness. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's not a quid pro quo. Right. <laughs> It's a great exchange. You know, a quid pro quo is something that is given or taken in return for something else. Um, what you were just talking about. It's different than the exchange where God took something and replaced it with something else freely, willingly. Um, and great passage that you came up with there in Romans 4. I, I went to Galatians 2. So let's, let's with hmm. this in mind, is there a catch? What do I need to add to it? What do I need to, is there something in the fine print? See, cause, because that's what religion has told people. Religion comes to your door like a like a door-to-door -door salesman, tells you that they're going to give you something for free, and you sign on the dotted line. Then all of a sudden, they've got you doing this, that, and the other thing in order to be a real Christian, in order to be fully committed, in order to be a disciple, or whatever they're going to call you. You've got to do this, 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 and this. It might be something to do with 
uh, prayer or the weekly prayer meeting. It might be something to do with uh, Sunday school, uh, just attending church every week, and don't forget to give. Uh, <laughs> the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and then if you start slipping up on some of those things, and, and you pretty much start developing your own list along the way, um, and then you find that you're not really keeping up with it, and so you ask God to forgive you again and try to recommit your dedication to him once again, um, and, and it's just, you know, that slippery slope all the time. And that's not the gospel. That's not what the Christian life was supposed to be. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, and there was a lot going on before he said this, but let's just jump in here. I have been crucified with Christ. I mean, just think about that for a second. Hmm. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, okay? Uh, it, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this world, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave and gave and gave himself for me. Now get this, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness, if right standing were through the law or through works, then Christ died in vain or for no purpose. Um, so you see, we, we can't get off on that stuff. We, we, it, it will just mess you up. In other words, if we needed to add something to it, if we needed to uh, contribute something to our salvation, just to make sure, the rich young ruler, he just wanted to make sure. Anything wrong with that? Uh, he, not if you don't understand the, the, the gospel, I guess. But Paul's point here is, if it's not by grace and grace alone, if there is a catch, <laughs> then <laughs> Jesus died for nothing. Hmm. And um, hang on to that. You know, so don't be walking around in, in fear, wondering where you stand with God when you've laid claim when you, by calling upon his name and, and believing that what, you know, when we say we believe in Jesus, I mean, to me, to, in simple terms, it, it means we, we believe that he did enough, more than enough, for us to get to where we needed to be uh, for eternity. Um, so, you know, it's like one of those things, Joel, we, we say, is there really a catch? Is, is the good news as good as you say it is? Is, is, is grace as good as, as God says it is? Um, remember the movie Field of Dreams? Of course, uh, that was filmed right down the road from us mm -hmm. here in Iowa. Um, <laughs> hey, Dad, want to have a catch? <laughs> hmm. Hey, Father. Yeah, that, that's a different kind of catch. Right. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not, he's not going to yeah. pull the rug out uh, uh, on you on this one. Yeah, exactly. It didn't, what you just said there just reminds me of Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah I won't let go of the ball this time. Right, yeah, and she lets go of it every time, and he goes falling flat. And and God doesn't do that to us. He, do, he doesn't say that, um, well, you're justified by grace apart from anything you do, but then really lay it down and say, but actually you do have to do some stuff. There is actually a catch. There is actually some stuff you have to do. And just kind of running with what you said there, you know, um, I do not nullify or set aside the grace of God. As Paul was determined, that was his message. That was what he went around teaching. That's what he was persecuted for, for preaching the grace of God, for saying that there is nothing a person can do in order to be made righteous. There's nothing a person can do. It can't be the works of the law. It can't be works of any kind. Because if righteousness does come through the law or through works of any kind, then Christ died in vain. So when we're saying there's got to be something I've got to do, then we're nullifying God's grace. We're saying righteousness comes through something that I do. And we are spitting on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're saying sorry, Jesus, uh, you know, again, thank you, Jesus, for what you did, but it wasn't enough because there's got to be something I've got to do on top of what you did. And that's saying that the cross isn't enough. That is insulting. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 10 said that's insulting the spirit of grace. A lot of people think that that passage is saying that you can use lose your salvation if you sin will, willfully. But really what that's saying is that if you go to any other sacrifice, if you go to anything other than the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, then you have insulted the spirit of grace. 
That's what that's what it means to insult the spirit of grace is to say that there's something I've got to do. It can't be the blood of Jesus. There's got to be more. Uh, any final uh, thoughts that you want to share, Cap? Well, well, there are, but I, I don't know that we need to, to get into to some of that or we're going to get off on, on some good rabbit trails. But I know we're running out of time for this one. I, I think I would just encourage people out there to to realize that regardless of, of what you heard, I mean, you, you gave a good example right there in Hebrews. You, you got people out there taking a little passage of Scripture <laughs> and, and flipping the script, literally, turning it inside out from what it really means. Uh, they'll, they'll be devoted, dedicated, uh, trumpet-blowing Bible believers uh, but then they'll tell you, uh, if you don't keep up here, if you don't hold up your end of the deal, uh, you'll end up in hell for all of eternity. <laughs> and and that puts all kinds of fear into people. It's just wrong. And, and yet, you know, people will do it. They'll, they'll take the very words that were meant to bring encouragement to people and turn it into something else. And I get it. You know, we take things out of context. Nobody has a perfect understanding of the writings. But uh, some people can get way off the mark um, very easily. Um, and so let's not insult the spirit of grace. Let's trust in what Jesus did, have, having been enough, uh, completely, fully, a finished work. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.